<laughs> Give me a camera and you're bound to find stupid shit. On it. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Driving Through Life. My name is Hunter. Uh, today is a very special episode. This is the first episode of Car Builder's Corner. And today we have a very special guest. His name is Beaker. Yes, it really is Beaker. It is on his birth certificate. Now, to introduce you to Beaker, Beaker has been around forever. He's one of the founding members of BHR Performance. And uh, one of the reasons that all of this got kicked off, say hello. High five. High five. Very nice. Uh, say hello, Beaker. Hello, Beaker. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what we wanted to do with this series is we wanted to take, uh, you know, some individuals from the, the community, uh, find some really cool cars, get to know those drivers a little bit better, uh, what they've done to their cars, and uh, I felt like it would be the best way to start with uh, one of our own. So, Beaker, what are you driving right now? So I've got a 2008 Acura TSX with the K24A2. Cool. Awesome. Mm. Now, this is... Uh, a lot more comfortable to drive than some of your your previous vehicles. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I, I I did a whole episode on my first car. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your first car? Well, my first car, if you can call it a first car, technically is a 1965 Ford Mustang. Yeah. Granted, sure. I it was never registered. Sure. And I could only drive it down the street and back because the tires were rotting and we we're gonna blow. But. <laughs> That, that was my, my first car, and that was that kind of hooked me on Mustangs for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, it started off with a V8. Um, when we first started hanging out, I've known Beaker since, uh, since high school, been turning wrenches together forever, done some crazy shit. But when I first met you, you were driving a uh, red Prelude. What yep. year was that? 1993. It was the first Honda that I've ever liked in my life. And that was because when VTEC kicked in, whatever the hell you did to that intake, it was like... And we yeah. used to race, well, legally yeah, on go the fast strip. on, on right. State Street. Um, well, we, we drove the speed limit on the way to State Street, well, through State Street too. We Rocky drag race. Raceway. Yeah, we drag race. It is what it is. Uh, so great memories of that car. I love yeah. that car a whole hell of a lot. Yeah. Uh, tell me, what has been your favorite car to own so far? I know you've had a few. You know, the, the 2002 WRX, the Bug Eye that uh -huh. I had, that one was one of the most fun cars to drive. Sure. All-wheel drive, turbocharged, plenty of torque, and you can whip it around in the snow and you know, have a good time. But I think 1993 Prelude holds a special place in my heart just yeah, because... Of you know, it was my first first decent horsepower car. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a fun car. The WRX was awesome. Um, I yeah. dig the, the the Bug Eye. Uh, at the time, when he had his Bug Eye, I had a uh, blown up uh, 06 WRX. Yeah. And there'll be an episode on that a little bit later on down the road. But we had Subarus, and it was awesome. Yeah. Uh, and... You were actually around turning wrenches when uh, we were part of Elise Motorsports and yep. we had the, the, the Nova and the 69 Camaro and yep. stuff. There's even a goat in the shop. There was even a goat was in a the shop. Mm -hmm. and now we're here. So uh, I know that when you start working on cars, you get very, very focused. What is it that just that makes you connect with the cars that you buy? You know, I, I think it's learning about the car i mean every car even nowadays with four cylinders hondas toyotas whatever it may be sure they're all unique you may have a k-series engine but there's the k20 the k24 and there's versions of the k24 they're all a little bit different right yeah. i mean mine has a different intake manifold than a different k24 with different passages and you know this one's a little bit unique because it has uh an idle air assist valve that actually injects air into uh, right above the injectors and it's controlled by a coolant thermostat basically sure you know and so there's just little things that are different about every car and 
even though it may be this, you know, K24, it's a different K24 and you get to learn everything about that car and its intricacies and, you know, what makes it tick and what makes it work and, and why it works that way. And that's just really exciting to me. Yeah. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more. One of the things that, uh, this kind of ties into, um, I'm going to tell you guys a, a fun story. One of many between me and Beaker. I bought an 87 Supra, uh, Mark three, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Uh, it had the seven M GTE motor in it. Mm. Um, and I bought it in pieces, but I was like, ah, oh, shit, I can put that back together. That's fine. And you know, the intercooler was off and it was, uh, it was in pieces. It was primer, but mm. the car never got rolling for me, but we worked on that Supra for, it was a while. We put it all back together. Still wouldn't work. And so I needed a car that ran. I was like, you know what? Fuck this. And so I bought a, uh, what did I buy at that time? I think it was an, uh, is that when I got the Eclipse? Yeah. Well, you had, a, I think you had a Jeep. You had the Eclipse still and you bought a Jeep Cherokee. Bought a Jeep. Because so you always buy cars. I said, it, and it was, this was when I lived in an apartment and the Supra was sitting under a tree just hanging out because we couldn't get it started. So I'm like, you know what, Baker? Here, I want it to go to go to a good home. Here's a car. And so I gave him that 87 Supra and uh, bought a Jeep Grand Cherokee. And within three hours or something like that, this asshole gives me a call. He's like, hey, guess what? And then he's like, oh, oh, I'm like, what the fuck? He was like, it was a fuel relay fuse. So you actually got an 87 Supra yeah. for the cost of a fuel relay. And looking back on it, I feel like a, an asshole because no, you don't. we were, no, no, we worked on it, worked on it. And then for some reason, once you had said, Hey, just come get it out of here. Then it magically came to your head. Well, huh? I pulled up with my truck and I remember looking at it thinking, okay, you know, he's replaced the fuel pump, injectors, you know, all this stuff is good. I was like, well, and it just cranks. You don't even smell fuel. So at the time I was thinking, well, Hey, it's gotta be, it's gotta be something simple. And I remember, I pulled up in my truck, my Toyota truck, and I pulled up in the fuse box on my truck and the one on the on the Supra <laughs> and looked at it and I was like, oh, the, the, the relay is just missing. <laughs> uh, so you remember, I, I ended up pulling the relay out and put it in the Supra and, and you started it started right up. Yeah. Yeah, you're a dick. Tell us a little bit more about the Acura. Shoot, so I've got it for about four years, okay. five years now, I guess. Um, it's been a good car. I've been driving it. It's fun to drive. It's got a decent amount of power, torque, and it's comfortable too. It's comfortable, yeah. Very it's comfortable, it's a yeah. four door, and you know, having a kid, it's it's nice to be able to have four doors. Sure. You don't have to fold down the seat and There's practicality, chuck them in. Yeah, which exactly. It's not something we've always been accustomed to. Well, it's the first time for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, no, it's it's. It's a nice car, but I, well, and the reason that I wanted to do it on this car is you literally just put it all back together. It's yeah. been running for how long? Now a week, two weeks, a week, maybe two yeah. weeks. Okay. But and yeah. and this was a project that you started because of what? What prompted this rebuild that you did? Well, there was a a random slight small shutter in between third and fourth gear at like 45 miles per hour sure like once a month yeah so i thought oh well it's did my research and found out that some transmission um pressure sensors were common to start failing these so i was like your wife might see this video well i mean i i've told this story over and over, and over <laughs> again, so i had it down by now <laughs> But no, I, I, I was going to just replace the sensors and uh, jacked the car up and found my front two wheels or tires were torn up on the inside showing cords and started looking around and I was finding you know rubber bushings that were cracked or torn or ball joints and, and my transmission had already been leaking a little bit from the, the main seal. So I thought, well, at this point, I might as well just drop the transmission and you know, fix all that. And then sure. it kind of just kept 
kept going and going and going until it was seven hundred dollars. What do we say here while we're in there? While we're in there, <laughs> it's a part of the kit. It's part of the kit. You know, yeah. I had to. One one thing leads to another, so it started off with some a little shutter and some rubber bushings, and it ended up with what we're about to take a look at. So without further ado, we're going to have Beaker show us around this car a little bit. All right, Beak, let's uh, let's go through. Like I said, you did a big build. Yeah. Look at this beautiful motor. Now, it looks pretty stock. Um, tell me how stock it really is and is not. Um, man, I it's stock other than the intake manifold. I ported and polished it by hand. Uh, I took a Dremel, some grinding pads, um, some sanding wheels, and polished everything all the way through until it was nice and smooth. And then I port matched them because there's actually a two-piece manifold that actually mounts together here. So I had to take the gasket and put it on there and mark it with some dye and then grind it and then polish it. So that way when you put it back together, there's not you know, a piece that it's running into. There's no lips. So that way it all smoothly you know, it flows. It's, it's not rough on the inside like, like the outside of the intake manifold because that's what it was like before. So now it's sure. all perfectly smooth. Um, and then, I mean, the intake there it's obviously it's stock intake it looks stock at least um it's actually got a can and filter in there a lot of people do that um but the resonator box i took out of it and you still see the hose maybe you can see it i don't know but there's a hose that's going down into the fender well and it still sucks up cold air um you know there's ct engineering a heel toe in heel toe automotive actually makes them now but they make a box just like this um that's look stock, but it's got a can in in it. And um, rather than buying one of those, I just basically made my own. So I saved myself a couple hundred dollars there. And then I've got a set of PLM headers, uh, four to two to one, try y headers. Um, I got these because they give better low end power, low end torque. Um, there were some other like Weapon R headers, stuff like that, that gives you higher RPM horsepower and I drive the car every day. I'm not driving it, at, you know, five, six, 7,000 RPMs every day. So, you know, to me, it made sense to get something that gave me drivability every day. So I went to the PLM that gave me some um, lower RPM horsepower and uh, the radiator, actually I got a Koyo Rad aluminum radiator and one of the main reasons I did that is because I had my transmission rebuilt. Um, it's basically brand new at this point. And I wanted to put a, an aftermarket transmission cooler in there. Um, I wanted to make sure that it was staying cool because these particular transmissions have been known to have some, some cooling issues. So I got a, a big bar and plate cooler. It's actually rated for a, a truck towing a trailer. Hmm. So I got one of those, made some custom brackets and mounted it uh, behind, the, behind the bumper there. Um, and then like anything else, you ever, you make a change and it's kind of a downhill rolling effect, right? So I put a standalone cooler in, well, now my old radiator has two little spots where radiator or the transmission fluid used to go in there. and so. Part of the reason why I went with the aluminum radiator here um, is because it was an upgrade, additional cooling, and uh, not to mention they didn't make one for an automatic transmission, so I didn't really have a choice. That helps. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, that's those are the primary things that, that make it not stock as far as parts go. But obviously, I mean, this kind of stuff, I painted the intake manifold. Um, I stripped it down so it was, you know, sanded, and then I primed the intake manifold, and then I uh, put a wrinkle coat on it and then cooked it in the oven, so I bake it on. This used to be a silver color, um, painted silver, and you know I masked this off and then painted this, primed it first, and then did a wrinkle coat. Um, same thing on the, the valve cover, stripped it down with uh, aircraft paint stripper and primed it, all that good stuff. And then the same thing with uh, the throttle body. I actually didn't prime that one, 
And that was my first attempt at the red paint. And to be honest with you, a part like that, I don't know if I would do it again because it didn't turn it out as well as it's I It's got a lot like, of texture, a lot of corners to yeah, it. Yeah, um, it bunches up. It's a nice piece to have in there as kind of an accent. Yeah. Um, but there's, it seems like it'd be a little bit, a little bit tricky to, to really mask off and to, uh, it, in the paint. It was, <laughs> but you know, in the long run, you look, you see the red and my thing is going for, okay, you don't want too much. You want too little, but you want little pops of color here. And so a lot of this was thought out. You know, I didn't want a silver intake manifold. I wanted to kind of blend together, but mm -hmm. have little pops of color. So there's a lot of thought as, as simple as it looks going into the color schemes and you know, what would look good. Now, as far as uh, suspension yeah. handling, this is actually stock. Am I correct? This yes. tower bar? Yeah, impressively. Uh, so Acura designed this. This is a, they call it the TSX stands for Technical Sport Experimental. And Acura wanted to build a sedan or a sports sedan that was an entry level luxury sports sedan. And, you know, part of that was putting in the, the largest well, four cylinder, as far as leaders go, into the Acura, but also these kind of little details, you know, the, the strut bar that is, I mean, it goes across from the strut towers, but it's also on the firewall and, you know, independent front and rear suspension. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a nice handling car, but since then I've put the TAN or TN, I never really know <laughs> how to say it because everybody has their own way, yeah, but, yeah. um, I put some street basis, uh, adjustable coil overs on it. Uh, so just to lower it a little bit, I don't like to lower it too much because I still like to be able to go over bumps and things like that, but just enough to, you know, give it a little bit better handling and lower it just a little bit. And how have you liked those? The, the basic, it was a street basics or whatever. Yeah, street I basis. Um, you know, they were really nice. They, they still are nice. Um, they're like 400 bucks. They're surprisingly super cheap. I think it was 400 after shipping and tax and all. I think it was like $500. But it's an impressive product for that price. Because I was looking at just struts from O'Reilly's or, you know, all sure. these different places. And it, $500, I was basically be spending $400 just to get some, you know, parts from O'Reilly. And, and these have been great. And mo most coilovers, um, <clears throat> with the exception, uh, ex uh, exception of a local brand, Raceland, which actually they have a relatively impressive product mm. now, years later. Um, but their coilovers are, you know, four to 600 bucks. And the reason they keep their pricing so low is because they don't deal with distributors at all. It's by direct. Uh, uh, Tien is, is a different animal. I mean, most of their coilovers are going to be, uh, you know, around the range of a thousand bucks, 900 bucks. So sometimes when you're looking for a little bit of, of comfort as well, uh, you know, it's okay to, to look into uh, cheaper products, especially when it comes with a, a name brand like Tane. So, yeah. And a lot of it has to do with the research too. I found, I mean, you don't want to just go with something because it's cheap, right? Because you end up getting what you pay for. So coming from a well-known company, that's great. But I mean, even like the PLM headers, I've never heard of PLM. I've heard of DC Sports. I've heard of NVIDIA. I've heard of all these different companies that make exhaust components, but I'd never heard of PLM. And I just researched and researched, looked on the forums. And, and then after I found the stuff on the forums, I was like, okay, we'll research those more in depth. And, and the more I started finding, I started finding, you know, dyno records and, you know, things like that, that, you know, made me feel comfortable with buying it and they're good quality parts. So it's, it's, it's important to do the research, you know, and, and Dino, uh, <clears throat> Dino doesn't lie. Um, now you have the radiator, you have the, uh, you actually have a, uh, transmission, uh, temp sensor, right? And it is mounted to an AEM gauge, a digital gauge. And you hit it like a sneaky squirrel, didn't you? Yeah. Well, I didn't want I didn't want it to be obvious, you know. Yeah, like of course. You see the people with the gauge clusters all up along the side, and you know that doesn't fit for my style. You know, I I think it's cool maybe in a race car, but um, for something streetable. So let's go ahead and take yeah. a look at where you hid that. All right. So let's go ahead and get in the accurate. Oh. 
Oh, okay. Oh, wait, you see that? that Sh- check engine light? No, no, the doors are open. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so to be clear, so people don't, well, okay, you know, let's just press, boop. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's I, magic. It's so, gone. We should they, sell that product. There's no cat on it right now, but I, I'm not totally driving legal. it every day. Yeah, you know, I'm just, I got to go to the, the emissions place and get it put on. So Sure. Yeah. Right. So here's the temp sense. Watch this. Like a little, like a little bat cave. And you just press it and bam. Temp sense. And I see that you have room mm-hmm. for more. Yeah. Um, I'm planning on putting a, a coolant temperature sensor, oil pressure sensor, and then I'm going to have to find new places to hide AFR and and eventually boost. Eventually boost. All right, so talking about boost, a couple of things I want to chat about. We were having a little bit of a interesting conversation earlier about exhaust, exhaust sizing. Yep. Um, now, earlier you said that it was in the future plans for you to uh, actually do switch over to a supercharger. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, what, what are your future plans? Um, so in, in the future, I want to get a, uh, supercharger, um, Merc Racing makes a, a kit, right? Um, it's, doesn't have tuning, so you got to get that taken care sure. of or injectors, but yeah, I want to, I want to put a supercharger on it and, you know, see how much boost I can run. Why supercharger versus turbo in this application? So for me, it's, it's partially a personal decision and and just well there's other things like heat um turbocharged cars like the wrx i love turbochargers and they work great but they also generate a lot of heat under the engine bay and i i've run into you know cracked vacuum hoses oil lines you know tapping into the the oil pan and running extra oil lines and you know so it's just you know a lot of heat under the hood that i don't really want to deal with and sure. you know all the other wear and tear from it. Superchargers also have a ten- tendency to be a little bit more reliable. Um, if you're looking for a streetable car, something that's not going to blow up, um, <laughs> superchargers. <coughs> well, superchargers have a, a tendency uh, to make more reliable power. Uh, and for linear most, power too. linear yeah. power, which is very important. So you're going to run out on the top end, but how often on the street regularly, just driving day to day, yeah. are you going to be cranking out that top end and really be worrying about that? Yeah. Not as much. Right. Um, now talking about exhaust, you're obviously going to do an exhaust next right mm-hmm. now. You have something kind of rigged up in there because yeah. of the headers. Um, now we were having an interesting conversation about exhaust sizing. Yeah. Now, Kind of the rule of thumb with four-cylinder cars on average seems to be about two and a quarter to two and a half yeah. inch mm-hmm. exhaust all the way back. Mm-hmm. Um, now whether that's dual after the cat, whatever it is, typically you don't want to get too big of exhaust because your motor actually needs some sort of back pressure to operate. And when you don't have much of a motor, for example, a, a, a four-cylinder, um, a lot of times that can be a, a huge hindrance if you're throwing a three inch exhaust on a four cylinder car. However, yeah. in this specific application, you were telling me a little bit earlier that a lot of people actually recommend a three inch exhaust on this car. Yeah, which that was r- <laughs> hard for me to wrap my head around. Sure. And I ended up getting into the you know a lot of the science behind of it and. I still don't understand why this car does better with a three inch exhaust, but I've, I've been bouncing across the forums and, and looking at dyno. Somebody actually had a video where they put a 2.5 inch exhaust on and then they put a three inch exhaust on and they actually gain power on the, the, the K series. The K24 is what they were testing on. But, you know, they, they said you'd lose power traditionally on like a B series motor or any of the other H-series four cylinders. So, mm-hmm. There's something unique about the engine, and I haven't been able to get to the point where I have found somebody or um, gained the understanding of why that's the case. But it, it kind of blew my mind because you know it's all about velocity, exhaust gas velocity, sure. and how long it's evacuating it or you know 
getting it out of the system so that way it's you know not bouncing back managing on managing back pressure is 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 exactly so it's huge and it's counterintuitive to what a lot of people have been told but again that's a great example of going out there and actually doing your research because if i have a four-cylinder vehicle on average unless it is if it's naturally aspirated, I'm always going to go with two and a quarter or two and a half, depending on the motor. Uh, if it's turbo, then yeah, feel free to go three inch. Uh, you know, for example, all the, you know, the Subarus we had, et cetera, that's all going to be yeah. three inch. Yeah. Uh, the GTO is going to be three inch. Um, uh, my girlfriend's uh, Subaru will eventually probably be three inch, two and three quarters, somewhere around that area. She doesn't drive it very hard. But in this scenario, you're always going to want to visit the forms. You're always going to want to do uh, visit the data sheets. You know, the great news is, is people love dynoing their car. Yeah. So there are plenty of examples of, of people that have, uh, you know, smaller exhausts versus larger exhausts, um, you know, that are going to give you the, the examples, um, you know, to go from. So what is the next thing you're going to do to this car? Next thing is definitely the exhaust. Exhaust. What are you um, looking at for exhaust? So I'm looking at uh, a mandrel bent kit. Um, a company called Truebins actually makes a mandrel bit kit where you know it, you get it and it comes in pieces and they press fit together and you can weld them, mm -hmm. right? Which this is another thing about doing your research is I've never heard of Truebins. Neither have I. But I've been going talking to exhaust shops and they're like, well, we don't have a mandrel bender. Or, you know, well, we don't really do stainless steel. Or, you don't want the crushing, the uh, crushing yeah. bend stuff. You no, know, anyway, it's, so. it's, 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 yeah, I don't like that. So I found, I found them through somebody on the forums, you know, and, you know, what people say on the forums, obviously, it's not always right. There's a lot of people that just like to talk and, you know, they haven't learned or don't have the experience and they're just saying what they think is true. But, there's also a lot of good information on the forums, and I found uh, this mandrel bent. They sell 2.5 inch and 3 inch kits that you can get. They ship to you. You can mock it up, have somebody weld it. So uh, I think the next step for me is to get the 3 inch stainless steel exhaust, get it mocked up. Uh, I think I'm going to go with a Flowmaster Flow FX. Um, it's a high flowing cat straight through, but it's got some some packing in it to keep it sure. quiet. And then, uh, yeah, just kind of prep, think into the future for the, the supercharger when it comes time. Yeah, and we, we were driving this over. It, this car is really, really fun to drive. And a lot of times when you've had a bunch of cars that are fast or, or you know, you've built a lot of cars sometimes, it's easy to uh, think that you have to have a turbocharger or a supercharger or a V8 or something like that to really be enjoying your car. Um, this is a perfect example of... Uh, a really fun to drive car handles tight as hell in the corners accelerates awesome sounds great but you can still start it up in the morning without pissing off the neighbors i haven't figured out how to do that yet um you can still drive it through a neighborhood without it shaking the windows um and it's comfortable streetable performance yeah. and you've done a great job really making it all come together it pops like hell oh, it's uh, uh, you know a really good build, and you know looking forward to seeing what you do next to it. A little bit of news here. Good news, everyone. The Driving through life uh, channel. We actually uh, did a video. I did a video <clears throat> not too long ago about the changing of a brand and kind of the changing of, uh, of the guard, essentially from BHR Performance, and not getting hung up on an idea for too long and being able to have that fresh start. Um, the fresh start is Lost Socket Garage. Uh, where our site's coming up here really, really soon, lostsocketgarage.com. We're going to have a ton of different parts. We're going to have some really cool specialty items that you can buy. Uh, we even got shirts. We got shirts now, Lost Socket Garage. Woo -hoo. Let's take a look at that bad boy. Oh, yeah. Everybody Ooh, knows. Everybody knows that a 10 millimeters are always fine. So, Lost Socket Garage, keep that in mind. I'll post the uh, the website once it's it's live, but uh, I'm really excited for the new brand, the, the, the changes um, that, you know, I'll be able to bring and, you know, check out the merchandise and all that crap. Now you have a shop helper. I, I do. You have a shop helper. He's seven years old. He's, He's a, seven little, years just old. A, just a little. There's a little guy. Shop elf. He, yeah. he is a gearhead in training, as I understand. Yeah. He's, he's got a Porsche Power Wheels and he was, drove it around for about <laughs> a minute before he stopped while we were taping it and he pops open the hood. <laughs> what are you doing? 
That's a checking proud out moment. the engine, Dad. I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. my boy. Proud moment. <laughs> well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring him out here. We're going to uh, see if he has some words about the car. Sound sure good? We will. Yeah. Let's absolutely. Get him. This is Colby, everyone. This is Beaker's little man, his little helper in the garage. Uh, I hear that you like cars. Do you like them a lot? Yeah. I have, a, I have toy cars that I play with. All the time, huh? Yeah. And your uncle Hunter gets you cars all the time too for your birthday and stuff. Yeah. Huh? I, I I was playing them with I was playing with them today and and I was like racing with them and whoever won was eliminated and then really? they're moving on to the next race. He's bracket racing already. That's wonderful. So your dad has been working on this car for a long time, huh? Yeah. Um, you, I think he started live. I forgot, but I think, well, well, in the garage, one time he had some mouse in it here, but now we got rid of them. <laughs> yeah. But, but the engine is very good. Um, I think it's very good. Um, we went to Pizza Hut today and then he speeded us up and it was like, Going fast like a race car. It was fast, huh? And it handles really good too. You now you have a little child seat in the back, <coughs> so you don't get thrown around a whole lot. Yeah, it's a booster seat. Um, I'm seven. And... Now I hear you have your own car. It, it's it's it, a Porsche, huh? Yes. Um, it's just a like it's not a real car. It's oh. like just one of those mini cars that little like electric like, cars, like, huh? Yeah, like large. Uh huh. Like this wide. Oh, okay. And it's pretty fast. And like this tall. Yeah, fast. Um, not pretty fast. Um, but you have to put battery. Yeah, do you like have this white battery? Um, and then you put it in, and then and then it gets ready to drive. I bet it's a lot of fun to drive, huh? Yeah. And then one day. You'll get to drive this. Well, not this. Maybe I'll get a different car. Maybe you'll get a different car. <laughs> what kind of car would you get? Mm, if I was rich, I would get a Lamborghini. Lamborghini? What color? Um, orange. It's orange. my favorite c color. That's a great color. Well, hopefully we'll be able to get you an orange Lamborghini here. Well, if, when you're old enough to drive. Yes. But you will have to be really, really rich. Really, really rich. Mm -hmm. Okay, deal. Yes. Well, thanks for joining me today, Colby. Uh, I know you're excited for your dad to, to get this on the road and, and uh, put more stuff into it so you can help. Um, say goodbye to everybody. Bye. Bye. So, uh, thanks for our special guest today, Beaker. You're going to be probably seeing more of him in the future and the... Uh, <laughs> The Honda. Maybe we'll tell you the story how he got that nickname one day. But thanks again, Beaker. Appreciate yeah. it, man. Always a pleasure. Um, Absolutely. Go out there. Have fun. Be happy. Don't be a dick. And as always, keep on driving. Keep on driving! So, so I mean, we were, we're talking. We're talking. Hey, look into the camera. Look, in, look into the camera and tell everyone. I am a fucking professional, sir. Okay, obviously. He walks off the set. It's, <laughs> we're not even a minute into it. <laughs> I, I mean, if, if that's how we're going to roll.